with the sounds of their footsteps breaking the occasional branch, the background hum of cicadas and the calls of different birds, Salot Sa, his wife, Kiu Ponari, his assistant Pang, and two bodyguards set out into the thick jungles on the hills of Ratanakiri. The air was thick and damp and the brilliant different shades of green leaves mixed with the rich, earthy colours of the path they walked down from Office 100, the hidden headquarters of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. It was an early morning in November, and they had left before the sun had come up too high into the sky. As the patches of fog began to evaporate, they eventually made their way toward the network of paths that made up the infamous Ho Chi Minh Trail. They were walking to Hanoi, and it was likely that they had been summoned there by the leaders of the Vietnamese Workers' Party. One can imagine, as they walked, the husband and wife a little bit behind the bodyguards and assistant setting the pace and navigating the way ahead of them, that perhaps Q Ponnery might have occasionally grabbed the leader of the Cambodian communists' arm. Perhaps she had seen something move, a shape behind a tree, a figure comprised of the shadows bouncing off of the vines and branches. Her paranoia of being watched, of people surrounding them in the forest, this had kept her awake before their long journey. Not that the prospect of being bombed by an American B-52 on one of the Operation Menu raids wasn't at least a possibility, or that they might be trapped in an ambush by Lon Knoll's troops that were hunting them in this area that had become their stronghold during the almost two years of armed struggle against the government. Kiu Ponnery herself had only barely escaped a police raid in Phnom Penh six months earlier, when she had been acting as a courier for her husband's messages to a zone leader west of the capital, Ta Mok. There had been a shootout, and she had ran for her life to get away. At this stage, at the end of 1969, the end of an extremely tough decade, and before the real carnage that the Communist Party of Kampuchea would unleash, you could be forgiven for feeling a degree of sympathy for Q. Ponnery, who had been the first woman to graduate Cambodia's most prestigious school, the Lysi Sithawat, and who had believed in the hope of this revolutionary movement since her days in Paris in the early 50s, where she had met the man who ended up becoming her husband. They had believed in this project, enough to live double lives, one teaching Cambodian literature, the other living in fear and in danger of being imprisoned in the night in a dingy cell in Phnom Penh and tortured to death or shot immediately after being sold out by someone that had defected to Sihanouk's police. And now Pol had spent the better part of the last decade living in various jungle encampments and she had finally joined him a few years back once it became too dangerous for her to continue operating as she had been in Phnom Penh. And she had cause for concern on this trip too, not just the dangers inherent in you know, walking through various terrains of the Second Indochina War, but also because their movement was in a precarious position. They had been summoned to Hanoi because government troops had been putting more pressure on the Vietnamese who were encamped on the Cambodian side of the border. But Pol was going to use the opportunity of the meeting to ask for more military assistance in his conflict, what had become the Cambodian Civil War. But the relationship between the Khmer Rouge, as Sihanouk had called them, and the Vietnamese communists had always been, well, a bit strained. Pol's last trip there in 1965 had ended in frustration when they had still refused to endorse his calls for an armed uprising instead being told that Sihanouk was simply too valuable in his position for the liberation of South Vietnam, that they must do nothing until the imperialists in Vietnam had been defeated. Then it would be Cambodia's turn. So Kiu Ponnery must have had some anxieties about heading to this city. Who knows what might happen on the journey there, and for that matter, what might happen in Hanoi. She had become fixated on the Vietnamese, convinced that they might betray her husband, poison his water, or that their troops might come to get them somehow. But these kinds of thoughts were also not completely out of the ordinary for the Khmer Rouge to think out loud sometimes, so perhaps she was just reacting to the stress. But in the last few years, 
Some people close to her, they had begun to notice that she seemed to fall into periods where she would be overwhelmed. She would shut down. She wouldn't eat, or bathe, or sleep. Again, not that these activities were the easiest to perform when you were living in the jungle. But it had become a noticeable pattern. As she squeezed his arm again, asking him if he saw something behind a tree in the distance, he gently patted her hand, and in his calm, soothing way of speaking, explained to her it was simply a trick of the light. There was nothing to worry about. That if anything, it might have just been a gibbon or a squirrel. Not Vietnamese troops coming to get them. Salot Sa might have noticed these paranoid thoughts cropping up from time to time, but probably did not know that his wife was showing more signs that she was suffering from the onset of schizophrenia, and that it would become completely debilitating by the time that his revolutionary movement would take Phnom Penh in just over five years' time. Her brother-in-law, Yang Sari, another top leader of the party, would later say that, quote, Her mental illness was already serious in 1970. She would ignore people directly in front of her. She just sat, quiet and lonely, end quote. A female revolutionary, Yong Muin, would also spend a lot of time with Kiu Ponnery in the jungle encampments and serving as a cook for Pol Pot until 1976. She said that, quote, she hated the Vietnamese very much, and I don't know why. She had travelled with her husband to China via Vietnam, and I don't know whether something happened to her and Pol Pot during that journey, end quote. Given that Ponnery and Pol would end up at the end of this trip to Hanoi in Beijing, I think there is a good chance that Yong Wen might have been referring to this journey that they had embarked on at the end of 1969. While it's impossible to say exactly whether Yong was correct in assuming that something on this journey, something that happened in Hanoi or Beijing, something triggered Ponnery's schizophrenia to become even worse, or, or this fixation on the Vietnamese, that's hard to say. What is certain about this trip, however, what is certain is that before the leader of the Cambodian communists and his wife come back to the country, so in the space of a few short months, the trajectory of their revolutionary struggle will change in radical ways. It will take huge strides forward. For the better part of this decade, where they had just been waiting and running and waiting, well, on the span of this trip to Hanoi and Beijing, practically overnight, the Khmer Rouge would have an army, a former king, and an extremely strong military backing on their side. By the end of 1969, a delegation of the Communist Party of Kampuchea went to Hanoi for talks with the Vietnamese party. The delegation, led by Comrade Secretary Pol Pot, made the journey on foot. The Vietnamese delegation was composed of Li Duan, Li Duc Tho, Vo Nguyen Giap, and Nguyen Duy Trinh. The Vietnamese were not pleased and opposed the struggle waged by the Communist Party of Kampuchea. The situation in Kampuchea became worse and was not favourable for the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese delegation was quite irritated. In spite of its efforts to preserve diplomatic courtesy, it could neither bridle its violent hostility toward the Kampuchean's revolution nor control its fury against the Communist Party of Kampuchea. Although he was underhanded and deceitful, Li Duan could not control himself. The talks took place in a very tense atmosphere, for the Communist Party of Kampuchea adopted a position of offensive and armed struggle, having in mind that Kampuchea's revolution would be destroyed if it did not abide by this position. 
As for the Vietnamese, they wanted the Communist Party of Kampuchea to give up the armed struggle and lay down its arms. Consequently, the contradiction between the two positions was irreducible. End quote. Folks, I've just been reading to you the writings of none other than Salot Sa, aka Pauk, aka Pol, aka Pol Pot, aka Brother Number One. There, as you can tell, he was reflecting on the trip that he, and the delegation including his wife, took to Hanoi that we introduced the show with. Now, it should be mentioned that he is writing this eight years after the fact in a book that Paul put together called Livre Noir, or The Black Book, with its subtitle, Facts and Evidences of the Acts of Aggression and Annexation of Vietnam Against Kampuchea. It was his attempt to show the world the, well, basically the, in his view, centuries-long victimization of Cambodia by their eastern neighbor. As by 1978, when he's writing it, they are at war. But it also includes lots of, in his eyes, party history from the pre-revolutionary period as well. There are lots of lies about how certain things happened, but in this instance, we are at least getting a picture of Pol's mind, both at the time he's writing it and some version of perhaps how he was feeling when he actually went on this trip and had this interaction with the Vietnamese. It's still good information for historians trying to figure out what went on, even if it's being based on you know what he's not saying, if that makes any sense. So a few things come out of this version that he shares. The first being, and you've heard this in the story again and again by 1969, the CPK leaders want to do more armed struggle. They want more guns, more weapons, more help in doing that. They ask their Vietnamese comrades, and the Vietnamese say, no, how about stop it, rinse and repeat. But obviously that would have been done via, you know, you're not really showing your hands, it's done in a, yes, we support you, but we only support you to do political struggle, we believe that is the best for revolution at this time. You know, it's, it's done behind a veil of, of sort of communist speak. But the way Pohl is writing it in this instance, he, he makes it seem like there was less niceties this time around. He was saying he was being more forthright, and the Vietnamese were responding in the same way. Chandler, here in his biography of Pol Pot, he says that it probably wasn't as heated as this, that if he had indeed been that aggressive in his requests, genuinely staking out a more independent path right in front of the Vietnamese, then they probably would have just replaced him. Which at this point, still for them, would have been fairly straightforward. Um, Similarly, if it had been that intense, then Pol may have genuinely feared to, you know, heed the call to go to Vietnam at all due to the possibility that he might not come back. Despite how heated he makes it seem like it was when he wrote about this eight years later, as we said, it's probably more him writing about how he might have felt back then and how he felt he was being treated that the Vietnamese, again, had failed to grasp how difficult the situation was for his party in Cambodia, as well as, as Chandler says, the uniqueness and surely in his mind, you know, the special value that he himself and his revolution's potential had. Like, they're not seeing my vision and, and why won't they support it? Again, you have to remember that they were literally at war when he wrote the book, so he is painting a picture that makes his movement and his country look more like the victim in that scenario. And given that Pol and his delegation stay in Hanoi for the next four months or so, it's probable that, much like his visit in 1965, as we said, probably a request for more assistance was made, but at this time, the Vietnamese were still constrained by their relationship with Sihanouk and preserving that as best as possible, while still trying to maintain the 40,000 or so Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops that were on Cambodian territory. As we said, they may have called him in to check in about what they could do about Lon Nol's troops kind of stepping up their efforts to eradicate them from this side of the border and to communicate, you know, what's going on with, with the CPK. And this increased pressure from Lon Nol's troops, from the government troops, well, they themselves are doing that because that number, 
40,000 troops, that presence, as we said in the last episode, that is starting to really create some strong historical hurricane conditions in Cambodia. For Sihanouk, this is going to be the key factor that will necessitate him playing some frantic political games to try and keep a lid on things. And on the 7th of January, 1970, he will, like Pol Pot, also have left Cambodia in an attempt to fix the situation he was facing. So let's jump back a few months and find out just how much of a mess he was in and just how much this will end up affecting Pol's time in Vietnam. So the political scene in 1969, as we saw in the last episode, it was becoming increasingly dire. Now, if you were just walking around Phnom Penh as a tourist, you might have had little inkling about just how precarious the situation had gotten out in the countryside with pockets of war between the struggling Khmer Rouge against Londol's stronger, but also not overly well-equipped army. As Osborne says, quote, Both sides, the army and the 5,000 or so insurgents, were locked in an increasingly brutal conflict in which neither side hesitated to kill cruelly and indiscriminately. Bizarre stories reached the capital of rebel captives having their heads sawn off while still alive and of severed heads being exposed in marketplaces as a warning to others. For their part, the rebels matched the army savagery with attacks on civilian targets, with innocent bus passengers massacred to reinforce warnings against cooperating with government troops. End quote. And it's not just that there's a civil war grumbling away. The more pressing issue for Sihanouk and other members in the government and army was this growing number of Vietnamese troops on Cambodian territory, as well as the impact of, you know, what many scholars have pointed to with the secret menu bombings having displaced those Vietnamese troops further west, further into the interior of the country. By 1969, the press in Phnom Penh was beginning to suggest concerns that there were large areas bordering Vietnam that had passed out of government control. So what does it mean to have Sihanouk as the head of state assuring everyone that Hanoi and the Viet Cong were allies of Cambodia? What did it mean to have those troops there and apparently him being unable to do anything about it? What would that mean after any war in Vietnam had concluded? What does it mean that the only head of state to visit North Vietnam for Ho Chi Minh's funeral in September was Sihanouk? I've been writing about this recently, so it's fresh in my mind, but perhaps less so for you, my dear listener. But you must recall that there are serious, long-standing anxieties that the Khmer have in regard to their eastern neighbour. Particularly from the 1800s, where the Vietnamese annexed the region around the Mekong Delta from Cambodia and took administrative control over much of the eastern side of the lands under Emperor Min Mang. I think we really went into this in maybe the third or fourth episode of the podcast. So you might recall from all the way back then, the story of the Master's Tea, this fable that even during the 60s, and you'll still see it occasionally today, was being shared by Cambodians as if it really happened. This legend where the Cambodian slaves are buried up to their necks and the Vietnamese master cooks tea on the sort of tripod that their heads form together. And as they writhe around, he says, oh, be careful not to spill the master's tea. For example, even someone like Hang Nho, a trained doctor who would go on to survive the regime and act in the film The Killing Fields, he said in his memoir, that he knew about the legend of the Master's Tea in 1970, and he and others still thought it had actually happened. Pol Pot includes it as if it was a fact of history in the black book that I mentioned earlier. The whole book was basically a list of these kinds of grievances from the Khmer perspective, but it points to something that's fairly close beneath the surface. So if you take that as just a microcosm of the kind of general, let's say, you know, the idea that there would be tens of thousands of well-armed, well-trained Vietnamese troops on Cambodian soil, you know, that sets off alarm bells deep in the guts of many Cambodians. And Sihanouk is fretting that the levers he was trying to pull to fix this, including letting the Americans bomb them, well, it was still not fixing the problem. As Osborne says, for Sihanouk's opponents, 
the time to change policies had come. Uh, under the pretext that uh, there is a, a war necessity, uh, so they, they come into Cambodia. Uh, already they occupy uh, some parts of our lands and they do not want to withdraw. Uh, our soldiers, our army, you know, uh, try to push them out, but uh, we are not strong enough uh, to, uh, you know, push them out. But so far as the Vietnamese are concerned, uh, are concerned you know, they have a, a very big uh, uh, population and there is a lack in Vietnam, a lack of uh, lands. They have not enough lands for everybody and we, we have more lands than we need. So, you know, the Vietnamese red or blues, always they have temptation, you know, to come into Cambodia and to occupy our lands. Uh, Another thing you might recall is this clip of Sihanouk from a half-hour segment that was broadcast on British television about Cambodia and the Prince. I played it in the very first episode of this podcast, which means we are officially back to where we started. Took around six years and about 40 hours of audio, but hey, that's the, you know. It was filmed in late 1969, and it highlights the kind of message that Sihanouk was giving to the world about the plight facing Cambodia from not just the Vietnam War, but the Vietnamese historically. And if this message is one that is willing to be spread at the highest level to the world, you can imagine the degree to which it is held by wider society. Do you think that your people would fight for their independence? For their independence and their way of life, their way of thinking, their own uh, philosophy. Because we do not share the philosophy of the Marxist. And uh, I am sure that uh, our peoples would fight. But uh, we, need, we need weapons, we need uh, planes, we need bombs, we need uh, uh, equipment, logistics. Is it possible to acquire them? Uh, we are not, we are not uh, rich enough to get them, you know, but uh, we would, if we have to face an invasion, we would uh, welcome any, you know, sending from the uh, free world uh, powers uh, of... Uh, In this segment, he also talks about the need for more equipment and weapons for the army in case Cambodia was invaded, while later a teenage girl speaks about how the prince would protect them and that they would fight for him. Are you afraid at all that you may one day be involved in defending your country, in fighting? I, I think that if it happens so, well, our prince will uh, help us as much as he can. And uh, we, we too, the Cambodian people, um, make the greatest effort to, uh, to defend our country. The irony being that the question of what side he would eventually be on when that invasion occurs is kind of interesting. And where would your allegiances lay if that was the case? But amongst shots of Sihanouk driving through a rural village and handing out sarongs to peasants or shoveling dirt in the countryside to mark the purchase of a new bulldozer for the construction of a road, doing his entertaining speeches for the people that he's done since the 1950s, the segment shows Sihanouk in glowing light. It was somewhat patronising about the country as a whole, sure, a little bit of its time, but it depicted Cambodia as a peaceful, simple country, with a popular leader trying to avoid war. But missing from the interview with Sihanouk, or the coverage of the country, is much of an indication of the troubles facing it internally. There's no mention of a civil war that was killing dozens of people a month, there was no mention of the casinos that Sihanouk had opened to try and fix the economy, issues that the politicians of Phnom Penh were acutely concerned with and would require change. In August 1969, the country's economic problems led to the resignation of the government that had come to office about a year and a half prior. The new cabinet of ministers was dubbed the Government of Salvation, and General Lon Nol was at its head. His deputy was Sirik Matak. Quickly, a reminder on these two. Lon Nol has been a mainstay of Cambodian politics and in the military since the early 1950s, even before Sihanouk's early moves for Cambodian independence. He was from a wealthy family. He had two brothers, Lon Nil, a rubber plantation owner in Kampong Cham, and his little brother, Lon Non, 
who, if you remember, was actually a student in the same class as Salot Tsar in the mid-1940s. Lon Knoll was an interesting guy. He's sort of an enigma. A little strange, comes off a little goofy even, but at times very shrewd and had this tendency to know what was going on with a lot of things, but not quite giving that impression. Someone of not many words. So sometimes you'd kind of get this idea of him as a bit naive and you'd scratch your mind and say, well, what was the reason behind doing that? And also, in his various military positions or head of government agents and police, he was certainly capable of ordering a torture or a killing or two. He also had some pretty wild ideas about Khmer ancestry and some racial religious views that were pretty out there too. But we'll speak about those at the end of the episode. For Sihanouk, Lon Nol, I think he thought of him kind of like a dog. A loyal dog who he could send in to attack, who he could use to defend himself from attacks, but a dog that would never betray him. And it seems that Sihanouk sometimes had this blind spot with certain people, probably out of being... I don't know, it must be weird to be a king, but he will have needs for certain people, like Dap Chuan, like Son Yok Tan, like Lon Nol, and he will offer them positions and power, but will not quite suspect that they might have their own motives and goals, which don't guarantee that he will be at the top of the table indefinitely. Now, Sirik Matak, he's someone we haven't spoken too much about in this series so far, and Perhaps if we give him his full name to begin with, we can get a bit more of a sense of him. So, Prince Sisawat Sirikmatak, part of the royal family, Sihanouk's cousin, although you know there were loads of them, so one of his cousins, he was part of the Sisawat branch of the two big families of the Cambodian royalty. Stemming from this decision, the French made after King Norodom died in 1904, where instead of putting one of his sons on the throne, they chose Norodom's half-brother, Sisawat. And it stayed on that dynastic track for a while, before switching back to the Norodoms again with Sihanouk's ascent to the throne in 1941. The French loved dabbling in the intrigue of the royals, even if they thought it was, you know, a native king. But I think those administrators back then probably still had a soft spot for the old conservative days of the French royalty as well. Not to mention they were picking people primarily on how useful they would be for controlling the country. Anyway, Sirik Matak, he's nine years older than Sihanouk, and he had been educated at the same school, and he'd met Lon Nol there way back in the 30s. They had formed this long-term friendship, even though they were a little bit of an odd mix. Matak had been involved in Cambodian politics since independence as well, and had led the right-wing conservative party prior to Sihanouk's Sankum government absorbing all of the parties into one big political gumbo. Sihanouk later wrote that he thought that Sirik Matak was always jealous that he was chosen for the throne instead of himself, and that's hard to corroborate, but let's just say it would have added a certain something to their relationship, which always seemed fairly antagonistic. Matak was a conservative, he had a lot of dealings with Chinese business, I think it's fair to say that he would have preferred Cambodia to work more in line with Thailand or South Vietnam in terms of economics, with less of a top-down semi-socialist economy that Sihanouk had tried to configure since about 1963. Matak had really fought against those moves to nationalise big parts of the economy, and he wasn't too keen on how much tolerance Sihanouk had for the kinds of well, basically, his entourage and cronies getting rich off of corruption by virtue of their ties to him. As an odd part of the story, an accident occurs in October 1969 when, I'll just quote Osborne here, after Lon Nol was injured when a jeep driven recklessly by Sihanouk overturned. End quote. Weirdly, this also happened back in 1967, around the time of the Samlout Rebellion. A lot of jeep accidents happening to Lon Nol. Anyway, Lon goes for medical treatment in France in October, and that leaves Sirik Matak as head of the government to replace him. Now, when I say head of the government, technically Sihanouk is always in this sort of above-all position, but as we've seen, this was mostly done in the past by him basically just picking whoever was going to be in his cabinet, and, you know, they would do pretty much what he wanted by virtue of him picking them to be there. 
but he's been letting that slip of late and has had very little input about who is now basically taking the actual reins of government, meaning the functions of government. He's head of state, but usually he's got a bunch of guys willing to do whatever he wants. That had changed from around 1967 in that election we mentioned a few episodes back, and there was this, I guess, the beginning of a reduction in what I guess you'd call diehard Sihanouk loyalists in the cabinet. Sirik Matak showed his determination to move the government in a new direction, away from Sihanouk's policies. And perhaps emboldened by the position that Sihanouk was in, popularity-wise, as a result of the state of the economy and a few other unpopular things, or perhaps because of the fact of, you know, his own personality and being in this position to finally do some, you know, serious work that he thought needed to be done. Sirik Matak strikes me as this guy who felt that he had the real ideas and that Sihanouk in this sort of clownish manner had been just using his popularity as the former king to basically ruin everything. But now the serious Sirik Matak is here to, you know, clean up the mess. So, backed by Parliament, he began to reverse the economic changes that Sihanouk had made in 1963 when he nationalised key industries and banks. It was also around the time when they really began distancing themselves from the United States. Now, Sirik Matak's changes here would have had effects economically that, in the last episode we spoke about, you know, these were hard choices that could have been made by Sihanouk if he had been so inclined, but he hadn't. And the idea behind these is that it's going to open up foreign investment and increase revenue from exports. Sirik Matak has also encouraged the Cambodian army to go back to the eastern and northeastern provinces where the largest concentrations of Vietnamese communist troops were. Hence, perhaps, Hanoi requesting Pol to come for a chat with them at the end of 1969. But in Phnom Penh, what's really chafing Sihanouk here is that while all these things are happening, like he's not just sat there keeping his mouth shut either, he's actively being like, hey, don't do that. Why aren't you doing what I want you to do? And this is happening, you know, to him. So what does he do? That's right, my dear listener. Phnom Penh International Film Festival, November 1969. Sihanouk's film, Twilight, which I personally felt was a bit more boring than Shadow Over Angkor from the year before. It ends up winning, guess this, first prize. Well, technically it's not even first prize, it's its own prize category. It's a two kilo solid gold Buddhist angel that was ordered from the National Bank. Rose petals are tossed out onto the crowd by members of the Royal Ballet, and amongst the dozens of other smaller statues handed out to other entrants from other countries, Sihanouk thanks everyone and promises the festival will be back next year. But it won't. In December, Sihanouk called a National Congress, and he tried to continue to discredit Sirik Matak's economic turnaround. He tries a ploy where the last four Sihanoukist members of the cabinet were encouraged by the prince to resign, you know, at, sort of in protest, as a means to get some attention, to say, like, this has all gone too far. If you keep going, where you can have our resignation. And Sirik Matak says, okay, resign, <laughs> resign. And then he replaces them with more ministers who aren't supporters of Sihanouk. Suddenly, Sihanouk sees the writing on the wall. He has no friends in government. I'll quote Chandler here from Tragedy of Cambodian History. Quote, for the first time since 1952, Sihanouk encountered sustained and well-organised opposition. Matak was not afraid of him. Sihanouk could take no credit for the economic reforms that were beginning to take effect, or the anti-Vietnamese mood that was beginning to spread in the elite. Worn out by his exertion and by the Vietnam War, and dispirited by the treatment he had got at the Congress, Sihanouk booked himself into a hospital, suffering from exhaustion wondering what to do next. Bruised, he decided to leave the country and allow events to take their course. End quote. Sihanouk was not winning anymore, and he knew it, but he still felt that he was the most important part of the system. This was, in his eyes, his country. There was even talk apparently shared between Sihanouk and his mother, Queen Kosamak, about, you know, what if I took back the throne and became king again? 
And she's like, no, son, you'd look like an idiot because of how many times you repeated you would never be king again when you abdicated in 1955. So there are signs, you know, these are signs of someone that's kind of being backed into a corner, right? Now, this kind of thing had happened at various points throughout Seanock's time in power. In fact, dating back to 1953, when he sort of left the capital for a while and went up near Siem Reap to kind of, you know, force through some political change just via his absence. And that ended up leading to, you know, his declaration of independence not not long after. And there's a few other times he would sort of just leave the country. He kind of lets things go to chaos almost on purpose, and then he would swoop back in and save the day, and then everyone would be back on his side, and he'd be able to point to the people that had been left in charge and say, yep, these guys were idiots, don't worry, I'm back. So, again, Sinuk thinks it might be time to, to, to try this trick again. He was due for his usual health treatment that he received in France for his weight issues. So he figures, what better time than now? And on the 7th of January... He flew out of Phnom Penh, although some very close to him noticed that he had packed quite a bit more than usual, and that perhaps this was not just a trip. This was more like someone fleeing. He had booked trips to both Moscow and Beijing after Paris, ostensibly to work into his plan on how to fix things from abroad, to compel those governments to try and reduce the Vietnamese presence on his land so that at least this pressing issue might not be working so much against him anymore. But, as David Chandler says, quote, he had miscalculated the single-mindedness of his opponents. At the beginning of 1970, Cambodia, which was to an extent his own invention, had begun to separate from him. As the new decade began, in Phnom Penh, it must have felt like there were so many possibilities. For those like Sirik Matak, his cousin was out of the country, he had a cabinet of ministers that were minded to take similar actions as himself, American relations had been mended over the last year, and there was a lot of anticipation for some kind of money faucet to open up. They could finally start doing something about those Vietnamese incursions into Cambodia, the economy might turn around. Maybe they could turn the army into an effective fighting force as well. Sihanouk may have balanced that tightrope, but maybe a whole new way of doing things would work even better. Well, as we know, things didn't turn out like that. Such is the study of history. But, as Chandler says, these were at least commendable goals. And, quote, some of the people around Sirik Matak may have been honest and talented enough to achieve them, had there been no Vietnam War or other international pressures. End quote. And that was the tricky thing. The timing of this. This episode presents, perhaps more than others, many opportunities to wonder what if. Now, aside from the big what ifs, like, as Chandler says, what if there was no Vietnam War, but on a more granular level... As we said in the last episode, what if the Tet Offensive hadn't occurred when it had? What if the Vietnamese hadn't needed that much of their forces on Cambodian soil at this time? And therefore, what if Johnson had stayed in the White House and kept negotiating for peace? What would that have meant for Sihanouk's position? Perhaps less pressured to give so much room for the communists in the first place? And here, in this period we're talking about, what if Sihanouk hadn't left Cambodia in January? What if, what if, what if? But he did. So what is going to happen while he is away? Well, as Chandler says, the so-called government of salvation that was running things while Sam Dak Eve, my Lord Papa, was out of the house, they had these commendable goals, but they took four badly calculated risks, in his words. The assumption that Sihanouk would be prepared to accept a figurehead role in Cambodian politics was a big one. Although this one was perhaps understandable, no, that's an understandable risk to take, he hadn't been prepared to really outright challenge Lon Nol and Sirik Matak by this point, so 
Perhaps that was an assumption that could be understood. The second big risk they took was the assumption that the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong armies would leave the sanctuaries on Cambodian soil and just head back to the front in South Vietnam to face the US and Southerners that wanted to kill them. The third risk, or assumption, was the idea that it was a possibility that a genuinely non-aligned Cambodia could just be. That whatever the Cambodian government was going to do, that would just be separate from interests in Vietnam or the United States. And finally, the fourth risk was assuming that the Cambodian communists, after their 15-year struggle, that they were just going to settle down and not continue trying to take control of the country through violent means. Now, as we know, all of those things are not going to work out. This was, as Carter Burke says in Aliens, it was a bad call. A bad call. But it's not like these guys were the first government in Cambodia to take some bad risks. Sihanouk had been wooing the communists abroad for years, hoping that that would solve all of his problems. And at the same time, he was killing all the communists at home, hoping that that would solve all of his problems. So he has also ignored and alienated Cambodia's educated elite and business class for the better part of a decade. And that was also a bad call. But I mean, you've seen the title of this episode. You know what happens in the story. Let's just say, as of January, a coup against Sihanouk is not a 100% certainty Although there's plenty of evidence that says that a plan was afoot. But things really do rapidly develop in these next few months, as we'll see. Okay, so I want to frame the lead up to the coup in this episode with particular focus on what we might as well call the Vietnamese problem. I've mentioned it 10 times already, my dear listener. There are 40,000 troops on Cambodian soil. As the first weeks of January came about... With Sihanouk overseas, with Lon Nol still recovering from the car accident in Europe, with Sirik Matak in charge in Phnom Penh, and with various international powers also quite interested in how to deal with this problem at this very moment, and there's also a certain central intelligence agency who's looking on at this as well, how is this problem going to be solved? Well, Lon Nol would actually meet Sihanouk in France, you know, he's recovering there, Sihanouk's having his health treatment, they meet up. There they discuss tactics about how to deal with the issue, which shows that at this point, Lon Nol was still engaged with Sihanouk enough that they had, you know, enough rapport to be able to discuss strategies. They're still working together. So what did they talk about? Well, a few of the sources here suggest that they were trying to come up with a coordinated policy on Vietnam and perhaps hatched a plan that we will see the results of in just a moment. But it's important to mention here that Lon Nol is urging Sihanouk to quickly return to Cambodia at this time. So by all accounts, he still is that loyal dog for Sihanouk now. He's trying to get him back. But perhaps saying you should come back without exactly saying what might happen if you don't. Osborne says that this fits with Lon Nol's personality. He was confident that something might happen but even at this late stage, he's still umming and ahhing about what to do for his prince. After this, Lon Nol heads back to Cambodia, and he has a couple of strategies in hand to deal with this Vietnamese problem. One is that he basically demonetizes the 500 riel note that's in circulation. Now, I'm not a particularly economically minded person, so I had to kind of look up what that means as when you demonetize something, it does mean what it says it means. You, you remove the value of that note, of its status as currency. And you might be thinking, that's a pretty weird thing to do to fight this Vietnamese problem. So the reason why he does it is that this banknote, which was equal to about 10 American dollars at the time, was the primary currency that the Vietnamese communists were using to purchase rice and other goods in Cambodia. So by recalling that, recalling that specific note, what he was doing is basically depriving an illegal enterprise, which can't just go to the bank and, you know, exchange it very easily. So you're cancelling out the money they have. I think it's in Chandler's book, he mentions a story that was shared by Francois Ponchot, the Catholic priest who would go on to write a um, very famous book about the, the revolution, Year Zero, uh, he shares this story 
where one of the Vietnamese members of his church comes to him one day and basically says, you know, Father, can I, can you break some notes for me? And then when he actually sees how much it is, it's about $10,000 worth of real. So this, uh, this person in his church uh, actually turned out to be um, basically, uh, you know, like the accountant for that local part of the, the Viet Cong in Cambodia. Anyway, Osborne characterizes this move by Lon Nol as quite shrewd, and it deprives the communists in Cambodia of tens of millions of dollars. But the quiet talking, big action Lon Nol, he's not done. In February, he orders artillery strikes on those areas of the northeastern provinces where there were a lot of Vietnamese forces. A captured document from the Vietnamese military communications at this point basically said, OK, we're a little bit confused as to what's happening now. Under Sihanouk, who was technically still head of state, this wasn't supposed to be happening. Although, just him not being there doesn't mean that he wasn't approving of some of these actions as well. And they're not going to stop there. It's a tricky situation to try and untangle it all, but if we assume that, like most scholars do, that Sihanouk was at this point still in the game. So he and Lon Nol have come up with this strategy to reduce the number of Vietnamese in a few different ways. Sihanouk's going to visit Beijing and Moscow and try, you know, diplomatically to, to force them to see if they can pull the Vietnamese back a bit. And Lon Nol will be back in Cambodia, trying to make moves that signal that as well. And one of those signals, which would have had to have been approved by Sihanouk, especially because his brother-in-law was the head of police in Phnom Penh, was a way of doing something diplomatic that isn't diplomatic. And that was to stage, quote-unquote, spontaneous protests by students and other people, and people pretending to be students, at the North Vietnamese and at the National Liberation Front's um, embassies in Phnom Penh. However, these, you know, demonstrations get out of hand. The buildings are broken into, set on fire, basically a mini riot on these buildings, although none of the actual representatives are injured. The students lowered the North Vietnamese flag and burnt it, and they chanted slogans like, Vietnamese stay out of Cambodia, and don't invade Cambodia again. So what is this supposed to do? Well, it broadcasts to the world and to the Vietnamese communists, that there is more than just a political discomfort with how things were going. That this was, on the surface anyway, a sudden outburst of, you know, the people's will. However, it wasn't supposed to go this far, with the buildings being set on fire, for example. And this is where Sihanouk, almost like he sees this as an opportunity to say, aha, okay, I'm going to distance myself from that. This isn't me. Look at this chaos going on in my country while I'm away. These clowns in charge are trying to make our friends into enemies. He announces that he would come back to Cambodia imminently. And this is on the 11th of March. And he's saying, I'm coming back to fix this. A clue to how Sihanouk was trying to play this politically is what he said in an interview with the New York Times on the 12th of March. He basically gives more of a real angle. He says that the communists, meaning the Vietnamese, could choose between respecting Cambodia's neutrality or they would see a pro-American government in Phnom Penh. So you can see how he is trying to play this, you know, abroad as, please, you guys have to back off or this issue will push me out of power. And he's also putting the blame back onto Lon Nol and Sirik Matak for the riots. Things move rather quickly from this point. Sirik Matak, sensing that Sihanouk is making political moves against him, cancels a big trade deal with the Provisional Revolutionary Government of South Vietnam, which is, you know, like the shadow government that the National Liberation Front had set up and that a few other socialist countries had already recognised. So cancelling that deal, that's like cancelling the deal with the future government of South Vietnam. So cancelling that deal is a pretty big deal. But even that is more subtle than what Lon Nol decides to do which was to make an announcement where he demanded all North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops off of Cambodian territory by Sunday the 15th of March, basically within three days. Unsurprisingly, the communist armies ignore this ultimatum. Sihanouk decides to not come back to Cambodia immediately, 
and that he will sort of come back by the 20th after continuing on to Moscow and Beijing as originally planned. This will prove to be a fateful decision, and perhaps if he had come back right at this moment, things might have played out differently. He will also make another fateful mistake prior to leaving Paris, where at the Cambodian embassy, he was walking around, you know, complaining about the situation. But crucially, he said, yeah, well, you know what, when I get back, I'll have this government of salvation, meaning the whole cabinet, I'll have them all shot, you know, I'll have them killed. Now, whether he truly meant this or not, probably didn't. It's more likely that he was just being over the top, being hyperbolic. But it's one of those things, like, if you write down a joke and someone else reads it, it sometimes loses a lot of the intent that was in the background there. So what we do know is that this threat had been secretly recorded and that tape would be sent back to Phnom Penh for people like Sirik Matak to listen to. And all of a sudden, it seems like they've only got a few days before Milord Papa will be back and there would be serious consequences. Threatening to have people killed is generally something that spooks people out. And what can the person that made the threat do? What can they say? Just say it was taken out of context? I meant I'd have you killed, metaphorically? Sirik Matak probably knows that it's all bluster, but he's able to use this to get other members of the cabinet even more on his side. So the 16th of March comes around, and by this time the ultimatum has come and gone, and now Sihanouk is in Moscow. In Phnom Penh, Matak plays a pretty clever move. What he does is calls the National Assembly to order, and he has Sihanouk's brother-in-law, the head of police, he basically calls him in to accuse him of corruption and illegal smuggling. Now that's a big deal when you go against the family of the prince, right? That's like going after the mob boss's son or something. It shows you're not playing by their rules anymore. By this time, there is a report being made by the CIA in Phnom Penh that basically says that they are aware that there are moves toward a coup being taken. And we'll discuss the did-they-didn't-they aspect of their involvement later in the episode as well. But for now, Sirk Matak, Lon Nol, they've called this assembly. They also organise more of those student anti-Vietnamese demonstrations to basically surround the building. So the police can't get in to help their boss. And Lon Nol helps this by also placing plain-clothed soldiers around the perimeter of the demonstration. So there's this extra barrier that even strong boys can't get through. So what goes on in the assembly? Well, aside from calling out one of Sihanouk's entourage, Sirik Matak sort of shifts the gears in there, and because they've got this anti-Vietnamese demonstration going on outside, well, they can do this thing where they say, well you know what, maybe we should talk about that issue as well. And everyone gets to come out and say, you know, these demonstrations over the last few days have been good. We support this. And you know what, maybe we should be doing something about these Vietnamese on our border. And they talk about that for, you know, a few hours. And then someone puts something on the floor for discussion. Apparently it's handed in, unsigned, written in pencil. And it mentions a topic for discussion that should be, quote, certain Khmer high personages who have through only their personal family interests supported the enemy of the nation by authorizing him to bring in supplies and medicine and have cooperated with the masters of the enemy, end quote. So that's not an exactly subtle stab at Sihanouk's friendly relations with the Vietnamese. As Osborne says, quote, Matak had brought the kingdom to within a step of overthrowing its chief of state, end quote. So essentially this Vietnamese problem is being spun back around on Sihanouk. And now Sirik Matak has basically got the whole of Cambodian politics not only stating that this is a problem that something must be done about, but they're now placing Sihanouk as the reason for this problem. What is bizarre is that even at this moment, Sihanouk is still sending messages back and forth with his mother, Queen Kosamak, and he's also, you know, the, the Assembly actually voted to send two ministers to Moscow to report to Sihanouk what was going on and ask him to return. Matak and Sihanouk talk about this on the phone, and Sihanouk refuses to see them and refuses to come back when he's been asked. It's not like 
there had been this complete severing of ties. It's not like what happened to Ziem in South Vietnam where one day the army just rolled up and killed him. Okay. And then things take another big step. On the night of the 16th, Sinuk's brother-in-law, so his wife Manik's brother, his name was Colonel Um Manarin, the guy that's just been accused of smuggling, and it's, you know, later that day, he basically reacts to being brought before the assembly like that by trying to arrest Lon Nol. And this, as Chandler says, backfired. And instead, Manarin is arrested. So now... Sirik Matak takes control of the police from one of Sihanouk's entourage, which is pretty huge if you're planning a coup. You've now got the police on your side. You've got the politicians on side. Now you just need the army. And that was Lon Knowles. In the very early morning of the 18th of March, Sirik Matak and two officers turned up at Lon Knowles' house and they wake him up. They demand right there and then that he signs a document that would approve the overthrow of the prince. Lon Nol hesitates. But then Sirik Matak says, Nol, my friend, if you do not sign this paper, we will shoot you. Lon Nol bursts into tears, but he pulls himself together and signs the decree. His action brought the army on side, and Sirik Matak had the assembly support necessary to make this a legally binding decision. And he knew that with Lon Nol having made up his mind and gotten fully on his side, that most of the other politicians would as well. The assembly met later that day, on the 18th. Article 15 of the Constitution, which declared the nation was in danger and gave the government powers to suspend a range of civil rights, was invoked. Then, the assembly moved on to the topic of Norodom Sihanouk by 11am. For two hours, speaker after speaker unleashed a tirade of abuse against the prince. His family, his wife, they charged him with treason, corruption, they call out the film festival, the casinos. They vented all of their frustrations. At 1pm, they voted to withdraw their confidence in Sihanouk. It was a unanimous decision. On the 18th of March, Hang Nyor was having a bowl of sour and spicy noodle soup. The day before, he had been involved in a rally, carrying a sign, shouting for the Vietnamese to go home. Everyone on the street seemed to be anti-Vietnamese, caught up in the spirit of this, but they still seemed all pro sihanouk Those things hadn't seemed incongruous to him. But he had noticed things seemed to be heating up. There were armoured cars and tanks taking up positions on the streets. The airport had been closed. But now, eating his soup, speaking with his friend in one of the busily chirping streets of the city with hawkers walking by and steam carrying succulent aromas from his bowl, suddenly an announcement came over the radio. The National Assembly had passed a vote of no confidence in Sihanouk. Everyone stopped. Everyone was staring in disbelief. Had they actually heard what that had said? He wasn't hungry anymore. They couldn't have heard it right. Overthrow Sihanouk? That was impossible. He took the radio from the stand and turned up the volume. They waited. Then the announcement was repeated. And he said that the hope they all had disappeared. Half a world away, Sihanouk would receive the news of what had happened while he was still in Moscow. His version of events, written in 1971, offer an interesting perspective. He has a recollection of the conversation he was having with the Soviet representative, you know, indicative of the last few days that he had been there, which apparently goes like this. And this is the Soviet representative speaking about what's going on back in Phnom Penh, before the coup. Quote, If they do this, we will never forgive them. 
It is a difficult historical moment for our Vietnamese comrades. They are fighting for the liberation of their country. Get rid of Lon Nol and Siric Matak. You have already given proof of your anti-imperialism. You have given previous support to the National Liberation Front. You have played a glorious role, and we count on you in the future too. And then Sihanouk says, I promised that my support for the National Liberation Front and their struggle for independence would never waver. End quote. So that's a very believable conversation that I'm sure happened just like that. But what Sihanouk doesn't mention, as he writes this book, is that his trip to Moscow, well, the purpose was to get them to try and pull back the Vietnamese communists in his country, and that hadn't come to anything. He was actually on the way to the airport to go to Beijing when he heard the initial news that he had been ousted by the assembly. In his version of events, when he gets on the plane, he's already drafting a speech, an appeal to the Cambodian people to rise up. He was already considering a resistance government, but it's much more likely that, at least on the flight, Sihanouk was probably just sitting there being cranky, and probably a little bit confused that his country was being taken away from him without his permission. If we continue with Sihanouk's version of events, which it was actually good to get this book out again because I hadn't been able to use it in a while. It's Sihanouk's memoir, as we said, from 1971, written by him and an Australian journalist slash communist propagandist, Wilfred Burchett. And I don't think Burchett would have taken on Bridget that description either. Anyway, one of the reasons that I haven't used the source in a while, it's called My War with the CIA, as I said, it's written in 1971, but we've been covering, you know, the mid to late 60s for a long time now. And, you know, you can ask yourself why maybe Sihanouk wasn't writing too much about the mid to late 60s in this book. There's a bit of a gap for those years, given that this time was filled with frequent attacks on the left, on the communists, making movies. So this book as we saw in that quote from the very real conversation he was having with the Soviet official, this book is very much a version of Sihanouk that has always been a friend of the communists. Okay, so he lands in Beijing, and he's met at the airport by Zhao Enlai. And in Sihanouk's version of things, this is what happens. He gets in the car, and Zhao Enlai says, I've got one question for you. Are you going to fight? And Sihanouk immediately says, Yes, I am. And then Zhao Enlai says, That's very noble, because this fight will be long and tough, so I'll give you 24 hours to think about it. And Sihanouk in this version says basically, I don't need 24 hours, but alright. He then says that Mao was full of personal praise for him. He called him an honorary communist, and says that, quote, From the beginning, the Chinese government respected my independence of thought and action, my royalism, my nationalism, my Buddhism, my dignity. They offered generous financial aid and, out of respect for my feelings, they definitely called it a loan, repayable 30 years after victory. Then he says, The French ambassador presented me with a message from his government to the effect that if I retired to France, they would place a villa, a car, and a chauffeur at my disposal. I thanked him and said, The Chinese government just offered me all these things, but they were only the first instalment. The second part consists of support for my cause, so I must accept their two-part offer and refuse yours. End quote. And that's pretty badass, right? Well, the real version might have been a little bit less so, a little bit less enthralling for the audience that Sihanouk was writing for in 1971. So in Chandler's Tragedy of Cambodian History, he has sources that claim that once Sihanouk arrived in Beijing, yes, he was met by Zhao Enlai, and yes, there was talk of what's going to happen next. But then Sihanouk goes to the Cambodian embassy. He was given a letter by a representative of the assembly back in Phnom Penh, which was the official letter which handed down the decision to dismiss him from office. He tore it up into tiny pieces and stormed around the room, saying repeatedly, I must return to Paris. I must return to Paris. And he had in fact asked a French ambassador in Beijing whether asylum in France was an option. It was obviously on his mind to sort of just retire to the French Riviera or somewhere nice, rather than his version, which apparently, you know, the the offer of French asylum comes unprompted and out of nowhere, just so he can very coolly deny such a weak manoeuvre. Funnily enough, 
Sihanouk wrote another account about 10 years after this, so after the democratic Kampuchea regime had fallen, and his role as a pawn and then a prisoner of them was over. There he changes things again to say that it was Mao himself that offered to help, not Zhao Enlai, and that perhaps this was part of an ulterior motive that this offer had much more to do with communism in Cambodia, but that change comes later. In any case, I think, just like in his movies, at this point, Sihanouk had a very big desire to be liked by the people he wanted to like him. And I think he probably felt that the socialist sphere had always been slightly nicer to him. These were the cool people at the party. And in writing the book in 1971, he's very much appealing to that audience. The same audience he was trying to woo in a film like Shadows Over Angkor. But his other side, his less than relaxed side, that we've seen many times, is also very much on display. Like, he doesn't know that the recording of him threatening to kill the government back in Phnom Penh has been released to them. And he's hearing a lot of the stuff that is now being openly said about him in the assembly, about his family, his faults. This is, like, imagine, this, this is les majesty. If there is one thing you can count on from royalty is that they don't particularly like hearing insults or threats or bad reviews of their movies or basically any criticism. And this is a guy that freaks out about pamphlets that say he's an imperialist. Or a newspaper, you know, he'll get a newspaper editor beaten up and left naked in the street for some clearly stated negative press that, you know, wasn't so subtle. So to have this very public struggle session against him, in the assembly he built, you know, the country that he secured independence for, he becomes fueled by a very personal vendetta. This, for him comes down to something as base as revenge. Having had the 24 hours that Zhao Enlai allotted for him to think about this fateful decision, Sihanouk did in fact decide to fight, rather than retire. It could be argued that this decision set up the fate of Cambodia for at least the next decade, if not the next 30 years. If anything, it sealed his own. He recorded a message that was broadcast on Beijing radio, saying that he promised that he would fight for justice in Cambodia, saying the coup against him was made by traitors and, you know, conveying essentially this message of revenge. Over the next few days, the means of exacting that revenge would be assembled. Now, interestingly, Sihanouk had always viewed the Chinese as this potential bulwark against Vietnamese domination, or as a way to leverage a position between East and West and what the United States demanded in the region. Similarly, the Soviets had interests that extended here as well, but for the Chinese, they saw a Lon Nol regime that would inevitably collapse as easy pickings for the Vietnamese Liberation Armies or the North. And as Philip Short characterises this, quote, Since 1965, China had viewed its relationship with Vietnam through the prism of the Sino-Soviet dispute. Beijing was still Hanoi's biggest source of military aid but Mao had reacted sharply against Le Duan's decision, apparently taken without Ho Chi Minh's knowledge, to open peace talks in Paris, seeing it as a step toward a US-Soviet global condominium. Vietnam already dominated Laos. In Zhao Enlai's judgment, a pro-American regime in Phnom Penh, especially led by Lon Nol, whom he had met and instinctively distrusted, would sooner or later collapse opening the way for Vietnamese, and in a worst case, Soviet, hegemony over the whole of Indochina. End quote. So what he is alluding to there is the overall guiding interest of the Chinese in what they would set up over the next few days, and what they've kind of had in mind since Geneva. And as Chandler says on this same topic, about Sihanouk being put in this position, quote, When he was fired up and safely installed in Beijing, his rancor and his international status served the interests of the Chinese, the Vietnamese, and the invisible Communist Party of Kampuchea. End quote. So let's see how that will work. Well, the day after Sihanouk had arrived in Beijing, meaning essentially the day after the coup had been formally carried out, the Chinese summoned Pham Van Dong, a veteran of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party days and Prime Minister of North Vietnam. So he's asked to have a sit-down with Sihanouk to discuss a new arrangement. Now, what Sihanouk doesn't know, and what is kept secret, is that Pol also comes to Beijing 
with Pham Van Dong. On the 22nd of March, so imagine those few days have been pretty wild for Sihanouk. He's not getting much sleep, he's fretting a bit. But he meets Pham Van Dong for breakfast, and he's impressed that the Chinese have been able to fly him out there in such a short time as well. Now what Pham Van Dong represents for Sihanouk is interesting, because Sihanouk still doesn't quite know the extent of a genuine Cambodian communist movement. That was receiving some support from the Vietnamese, but was only accepting this through gritted teeth and necessity. They very much had their own plans, as we know. It's also crazy to think that Sihanouk, the guy who's been hunting down the communists in Cambodia for a decade and been trying to get the Vietnamese troops out of his country for the last year and a half, well, now he was being placed toward the head of an organisation which was, as Pham Van Dong offered, basically they're going to have their troops trained by the Vietnamese to fight Lon Nol and Siric Matak. So that's the Vietnamese part of the deal, ostensibly. That's what they're offering. We're going to train an army to fight against Lon Nol for you. Now what's missing here is just the extent of how much fighting the Vietnamese communists are just going to do themselves, but we'll get to that later. And it's just like the Chinese are offering the money and military aid, but they have their interests behind a veil as well. And for Paul and his movement, I mean, Paul's really not visible at this stage, and it's just, you know, a vague idea of what Sinoc is probably considering just the Khmer Rouge. They're going to provide this base, this base of the movement that's already there, this countrywide network that they'd set up. But what is being glossed over for them in this new arrangement is, you know, their true intentions, of course, and what they are hoping to get out of this. So the alliance that is being formed in Beijing in the days following the coup is essentially Chinese aid to a Khmer resistance with military training from the Vietnamese and Sihanouk as the face of the package. This arrangement suits everyone. The Vietnamese are now unshackled from their need to protect the relationship with Sihanouk in Cambodia and can fight back against Lon Nô and secure their presence in the country, expanding the war to suit their needs for liberating South Vietnam. Sihanouk gets to have his revenge against the traitors in Phnom Penh. The CPK get a whole bunch of new support. We'll talk about that later. And the Chinese gain a bit of a foothold in allowing for a Khmer movement back toward power in the country that's going to be more friendly to their interests and not solely dominated by the Vietnamese and potentially the Soviets. This alliance would seek to establish a royal government of National Union of Kampuchea. The acronym that you'll see a lot is GRUNK, G-R-U-N-K, and this was to be fought for by a National United Front of Kampuchea, which got the acronym FUNK, F-U-N-K, and a National Liberation Army, which didn't get an acronym in any of the sources you read on this. Now, I realise this is one of those things that probably doesn't need explanation, but when you hear of a National Front... That essentially means a coalition of a few different groups coming together under a single, united objective or cause. So the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam, that was, on the surface, this nationalist movement to liberate the South from the control of, initially, the Xiem government. But even though it might have had a few groups in, it was still more or less a different kind of front, it was a front for the communists in South Vietnam in league with their northern compatriots in the same Vietnamese Workers' Party to overthrow the government and unify the country under one party. But just generally speaking, it's that you know a, f- a national front is a coalition, however real the different parts of the coalition are, and they have a stated goal, a stated objective. And Sihanouk would announce this in a speech a proclamation, a call to arms, which he broadcast the day after the meeting with Pham Van Dong on the 23rd of March. So how does this declaration, or as it's officially titled, Message and Solemn Declaration by Samdek Norodom Sihanouk, Head of State of Cambodia, what does it say? Well, I'll spend a bit of time on this because I think it's very important for a few reasons, but we'll have a look at the text first. Apologies, I had a look around to see if there was any audio recordings. I mean, they would have been in Khmer anyway. None popped up. So here's an English translation. Um, It begins by saying, quote, I pay my highest respects to Her Majesty the Queen and intend my respectful regards to the Buddhist clergy and my dear compatriots. I convey to you my most sincere, constant and affectionate feelings. 
the handful of reactionary bourgeois elements and princes who were able to climb to the highest position, thanks to the Sankum and its president and consequently seize all kinds of privileges, have not only expressed their gratitude by deposing me illegally, but moreover have slung mud at me, vilified me with monstrous slanders and base accusations, including the accusation of my betrayal of the motherland to serve foreign interests. Okay, so I'll cut in here for a moment. We'll give some thoughts. So, you know, it's very personal. He's targeting these people that have betrayed him. He's saying that, you know, they've illegally done so. And, you know, he is reacting to this, as I said, sort of these personal attacks at being called names and and these accusations against him. This is the front and centre thing for him to address first off in this declaration. Moving on. Quote, At present, the liberty, democracy, relative prosperity, national unity and union which our people enjoyed not long ago has been destroyed, reduced to nothing. Our soldiers have been ordered to give up defending the frontiers and the country's territory to set themselves against their own compatriots and ruthlessly repress all those who dare to show even the slightest verbal opposition to the new fascist power which serves US imperialism. However... Their condemnation does not disturb me much since they themselves are genuine renegades who have insatiable greed for power, wealth and fame, and are mere cowards who only dare to attack me in my absence and stab me in the back. Therefore, this despicable clique will not be able to affect me or make me fall back from my unshakable determination to defend the supreme long-term interests of my motherland and her liberty." The millions of Khmers at home and the thousands of Khmers abroad will certainly very soon uphold the banner of revolt against the reactionary Lon Nol Sirik Matak Cheng Heng clique and its masters, the US imperialists. The patriotic Khmers will overthrow these traitors and drive their accomplices and their US masters out of our country. After victory, our patriots will build up a new Kampuchea, whose power will remain forever in the hands of the progressive, industrious and pure working people, who will ensure that our motherland will have a bright future with social justice, equality and fraternity among all Khmers. Okay, cutting in again, just briefly. So we know who Lon Nol and Sirik Matak are, but you would have heard Chang Hang mentioned there as well, the other member of this clique. Uh, He's basically the prime minister who was in line to take over, given this reshuffle in power. Fairly unremarkable politician, you don't need to think much about him. What else? Sihanouk also gave a pretty rose-tinted glasses version of Cambodia prior to the coup, like this version that I guess we kind of saw on that British TV segment that we talked about earlier. It's very, you know, peaceful. But now he says that their own soldiers will kill you if you don't go along with the new government, and that they're not protecting the borders either which might be an effective point to make, but a little bit disingenuous coming from the guy that was at the head of the government a week prior. Aside from that, though, here we get to some of the real meat of the speech. He mentions the US imperialists a few times, so he's saying the new government is aligned with the US, but, you know, so much for Sihanouk's establishment of those ties with the United States six months prior. He's also asking for a revolt against the new government, overthrowing these traitors, and he has some not quite socialist language, sort of socialist adjacent, it's not too strong, and there is a reason for that, saying they're going to build a new Kampuchea. He then bemoans the treason again, and declares that it's actually him that basically doesn't recognise what they've done, and he spins it around and says that, you know, actually, I'm still head of state, and I dissolve your government. And then he calls on all Cambodians basically to, you know, not carry out anything they've decided or instructed people to do, just calls their new government illegitimate, basically. After this, he outlines his idea for a new government and the National Liberation Front, what we talked about before, the grunk and funk. Then he goes into the tasks of these new bodies Uh, to liberate the motherland from these traitors, to struggle against US imperialism, and to, quote, rebuild the country and make her advance as rapidly as possible along the road of progress 
following our victory over our enemies. This task of reconstruction is to be accomplished by all of us, the Khmers, in comradeship, solidarity, and perfect unity, as in times of hard fight. End quote. He goes on to say that he is longing to come home, he misses his mother, the Buddhist clergy, the people, and then, very importantly, he says, In the course of this struggle, I call on all those of my children, military and civilian, who can no longer endure the unjust oppression by the traitors and who have the courage and patriotic spirit needed for liberating the motherland, to engage in guerrilla warfare in the jungle against our enemies. If you are armed and have already mastered military skills, I will provide you at opportune moments with munitions and new arms. If you do not yet have arms, but wish to acquire military skills, I will take necessary measures to send you to the military school of the National United Front of our Kampuchea, which is being established way out from your barracks and villages, and this is for the purpose that the enemy will not be able to reach or locate it. End quote. So quite strong stuff there, quite a strong appeal and direction for the people listening. And then I think it has a kind of weak ending. He says, almost like an afterthought on an invitation, like someone had reminded him, oh, oh don't forget the Cambodians outside of the country. He says, oh, yeah, yeah. So he ends with this, quote, Those of my children who live in and around Europe and wish to serve the motherland and the people by joining the Liberation Army or the National United Front of Kampuchea, please come to call on me in Moscow or Peking. Long live Cambodia. Norodom Sihanouk, March 23rd. 1970. Alright, so that's the speech. Now, recall that Pol has been in Beijing since the day after Sihanouk got there, and Zhao Enlai had given a copy of the speech to him prior to its broadcast. Pol has suggested a few changes, notably the removal of all references to socialism. Instead, as you saw, we just got kind of softer language that wasn't going to spook anyone worried about communism. During this meeting, according to Philip Short, the Chinese Premier told him, quote, The Cambodian communists should think about the overall situation of the country and not dwell on past quarrels. Prince Sihanouk is a patriot and his international reputation is high. You should cooperate to form a joint government against the common enemy. End quote. And a short says Pol, you know, doesn't need much persuading there. But he doesn't meet the prince at this time as Zhao Wenlai was expecting, as you would expect. It's sort of, hey, we're now in an alliance together. My name's Salad Sar, how are you doing? Instead, what he does, he compiles a message of support for the new National Front, basically a response to Sihanouk's appeal. And he does this over the signatures of the so-called Three Ghosts, Hu Yuan, Kyu Sampan, and Hu Nim. You'll recall these were the prominent leftists in politics that Sihanouk had assumed were the leaders of the Khmer Rouge, who had fled the capital when it seemed like Sihanouk was about to imprison them. Many assumed that they had been killed by the prince's police in gruesome ways. So, you know, he signs this response to the speech from them, and he has this delivered to Sihanouk three days later. And Sihanouk, who was none the wiser in 1971, so a year later when he writes about it, he had this to say in his book, quote, One of the developments that pleased me most was receiving a message from three leading Khmer Rouge, the leftist deputies mentioned earlier as the only honest men elected in the 1966 elections, who had chosen to flee to embryo resistance bases in the jungle. These were three of our outstanding intellectuals, Sampan Anyon, French-trained economists with PhDs, and Hu Nim, a lawyer. End quote. He then characterizes their relationships in the past as, you know, minimizes the treatment that he had uh, given them. He says their relations were strained. So he was happy that when he's launched this appeal, they had gladly got on board with it, even though this had been orchestrated by Pol Pot. So it's a fairly shrewd move by him. Now, Sihanouk, in this part of the book that he's discussing this, he also makes sure to blame anything bad that had happened to the people on the left while he was in charge on Lon Nol, and says that he must have been receiving fake news about the Khmer Rouge, and that was probably because of the CIA. So quite the revision to the story. But the appeal he made did have an impact in Cambodia. 
amongst the wildly different reactions that different parts of the population in different places were having to Sihanouk's removal. Recall at the end of the speech, Sihanouk had appealed to anyone who was patriotic, meaning anyone that supported him or was inclined to distrust the new government, perhaps many of those who were still loyal to him in the countryside as opposed to Phnom Penh, he's calling on them to flee into the jungle. He's promising them weapons and training. This is huge for the Khmer Rouge. He had also not said anything about the Chinese or the Vietnamese in the speech. Even the national front that he talks about, like, what is it? Who is actually in it? None of that is included in the declaration. And to him, it doesn't matter. All that people need to know is that he's been betrayed and he needs your help. I honestly think it doesn't quite get the attention it probably deserves in terms of its effect on recruitment. Like, it's always mentioned, but perhaps secondary to other things. But as Steve Hedder says in his book, Cambodian Communism and the Vietnamese Model, quote, a golden opportunity to exploit his residual rural popularity by rallying forces behind what appeared to be his leadership. As one cadre put it, and he quotes the person, after Sihanouk's 23rd of March speech, we didn't have to do any fighting. Instructions were to pull over forces, and this we were able to do easily. And back to Hedda. As Grunk, head of state, and Funk, chairman, Sihanouk gave the Cambodian communists their most credible, non-communist face ever. But beneath him were the misleading faces of the French-educated intellectuals. End quote. So, there's a combination of things here. First, the real leadership of the CPK, meaning Pol and Nguyen Chea and Young Seri and some of the older generation Isarak guys, the real hardcore, they get to stay in the shadows. The real guys, basically. And the much less, what's even worth saying, much less trusted guys, the three ghosts, who weren't part of the actual mechanisms of the party centre, to the extent that they weren't, you know, making decisions at all, they get paraded out front. They are there to reassure Sihanouk because he has known them for ages, even though he wanted them dead. But as he said, this is a relief for him now. Some familiar faces, that kind of thing. But their importance is big for recruiting too. They are very trusted and popular. They were very prominent for, say, students. You, you'll recall that there were student protests when it was thought that Kiyo Sampan had been killed. They were very well respected in the Phnom Penh elite and in circles abroad. So this is almost like an all-star lineup now. This is the new summer blockbuster movie. Like, you know how perhaps a few actors might be away from the scene for ages, or there might have been a show or a series of movies that you think is just over, it's never coming back. In this case, you might think that these actors might have literally died. But, you know, in this metaphor, in this acting sense, it's more like after years and years, they're back. The original cast is back together. It's huge. And in the headlining role, this superstar that said he would never be in this kind of movie, well, here he is. It's Prince Norodom Sihanouk. It's like getting three of the most popular, I don't know, Gen Y and millennial actors in, I don't even know who, you know, pick, take your pick. But they're good and people love them. They're on board. And wait a second. Who is this joining them? Tom Hanks. It's a superstar lineup. It's a massive draw. And it's all just a front for the real Communist Party of Kampuchea. You will hear from a lot of different sources that the carpet bombing of Cambodia was this massive draw for the Khmer Rouge recruiting. And it will be, until 1973 when it ends. And then the same craters are pointed to afterwards to achieve the same effect. But what must be incorporated into that recruitment strategy is this larger aspect. This initial reason. This set up for any widespread ability to be able to say, do you want to go against the government? Do you want to liberate your country from this injustice? Your village has been bombed. Your mother's been injured. Your brother's dead. Do you know who you should join in the fight against who did that? Prince Norodom Sihanouk. Without Sihanouk, the whole picture is completely different. Bombing or not. The CPK are able to spread Sihanouk's speech around the country playing it on cassette tapes in villages far away from the capital. As Osborne says, it was instrumental in recruiting additional fighters to the leftist cause. And I think that his presence will continue to bolster this for the duration of the war.
So there are thousands of people lining up in the countryside in response to the call from the prince to drive out the imperialist Lonnol government. But what are some of the direct effects that we can look at? Well, there are some rather grim instances of violence that erupt in the aftermath, particularly in Kampong Cham, this large town northeast of Phnom Penh. There, university students joined villagers and plantation workers in large demonstrations against Lon Nol. They then moved on to break into the local governor's mansion, they burned tax records, and put up pictures of the prince around the town. As Philip Short says in his biography of Pol Pot, quote, Radio Phnom Penh described it as a provocation by people with a Viet Cong mentality, which raised the tension another notch. At dusk, two local MPs arrived from Phnom Penh to try to mediate. They were set upon and killed. Their livers were then cut out and borne in triumph to a local chef who was ordered to cook them. Afterwards, pieces were handed out to the crowd. The same evening, Lon Nol's half-brother, Lon Nil, was slain in similar circumstances at a nearby rubber plantation. His liver, too, was cooked and eaten. End quote. I have seen this story in other sources, too, and they prevaricate on whether this was, you know, the term they might use is it was a persistent rumour that this cannibalization occurred. But to be fair, usually Philip Short is the kind of source where he will call out other uses of those stories that don't say they are rumours. For instance, there's, you know, the teachers pushed off the cliff at Bokor, and a lot of books will share that as as, as if it happened, whereas, whereas Short will say, well, that was considered a rumour. Same thing with, you know, the, the piles of heads that were coming in on trucks into Phnom Penh during the Samlout Rebellion, and, you know, it's often reported as a fact, but, but he'll say that it, that was a rumour. In this case... It's around the other way, and he's he's not um, giving giving this the sense that it was a rumor. So, I guess like these stories, even if they were thought to be true, then that almost has the same effect at the time if people are hearing about this. So, I'll let you decide. Anyway, he goes on to share another instance of the violence that occurred as a result of Sihanouk's appeal, and this is also in Chandler's tragedy of Cambodian history. But I'll I'll go short here. Quote. That night, about a thousand people from Kampong Cham set out in lorries and buses for Phnom Penh, bearing portraits of Sihanouk. At the city outskirts, they were joined by another column from Siem Reap. Again, troops opened fire to drive them back. Some 10,000 peasants, following on foot, then sacked the government officers at Skun. This time, the army used heavy weaponry, killing and wounding about 60 people. At the weekend, another 200 died when troops with tanks and armoured cars broke up protest marches in Takeo and Prevang. End quote. Chandler mentions one young person who said that he was just so angry at being shot at, he wanted to take to the forest and build a new country, which is, well, you've got government troops shooting at you, that's never good for morale. But then the reasons he gave are almost exactly you know, framed in the same way that the prince's speech on the 23rd had asked people to act, as well as subsequent appeals that he will make in the, you know, in the wake of the violence that is uh, exchanged between these protesters and, and the government troops suppressing that. The appeal by Sihanouk also saw mass desertions from the army. Short mentions this was worst in Krache province, where the local commander just sent his men home and handed over control of the region to the resistance. So that is the extent of, you know, the impact that this appeal is having, right? This, in some people's eyes, was a sacrilegious move against the prince. And with all the rhetoric that we heard, you know, in that British interview before, one wonders whether the people had been primed for months and years now for the potential need to fight. But in Sihanouk's appeal, it becomes necessary to fight an internal invasion rather than an external one. Although there will be plenty, particularly back in Phnom Penh, who will now see what the prince has done, which is essentially wage a war against the government, they're going to see that as the invasion. And they will now flock to join the Republican army against what is being projected by them as the external invasion from the hereditary enemy, the Vietnamese, and Sihanouk has simply joined their side. It should be said, however, it's not as if every single person outside of Phnom Penh just 
fled to the jungle to join the resistance or took part in these protests. As Osborne says, many peasants were undoubtedly disturbed and unhappy at what had happened, but for many of them this meant that they would only passively support him following this change. But I think it certainly does set things up for these areas outside of the major cities and towns to acquiesce to what will ostensibly be Sihanouk's liberation army when they, quite soon, take over these parts of the country. But in reality, these will be Vietnamese soldiers doing the vast majority of fighting, but, you know, handing out badges with Sihanouk's face on them. And then it will be the Khmer Rouge, who have been trained by those Vietnamese. The Lon Nol regime began its earliest days in a strange, almost jubilant atmosphere for many in Phnom Penh. There was releasing political prisoners that had gone against Sihanouk, reopening the airports closed for the coup, welcoming foreign journalists back into the country that had been banned by Sihanouk, removing his pictures from things, this process of de sihanoukification As Chandler says, quote, For the first time in nearly 20 years, Educated Cambodians were free to express their political opinions. End quote. Hang Nyo, who had learned of Sinuk's ouster while eating a tasty soup, recalled next that, quote, In a short time, a new government emerged, with Lon Nol as its chief of state. Soon the government owned television and radio stations and the newspapers that were friendly to it, accused Sinuk of corruption and other crimes. But the attempt to discredit Sinuk didn't stop there. Back in my hometown, my sister Chai Tao's husband, a teacher, took me to see a pigsty. There, partially buried under manure, was a statue of Sihanouk, its head severed from its body. End quote. He goes on to say that his brother-in-law explained that the same thing had happened in the town over, that they had gotten orders to destroy them, that these orders were coming from high up. And that soon extended into other spheres of life, in the school system. Teachers were supposed to tell their students that Sihanouk was a corrupt traitor and that they were then supposed to repeat this to their parents. He said this is causing some strife for a while, but after a few weeks, this clash and, for instance, those violent eruptions of chaos in places like Kampong Cham and Kampot, they do die down. A kind of normality returns. I basically take this as a desire for most people to just get on with their lives as most people can be expected to do, even in wartime. However, in just the first few weeks of the regime, there will be troubling signs about what is to follow in the next five years, and just how quickly the Lon Nol regime will lose huge amounts of territory, and Cambodia will be directly opened up into the Second Indochina War. Very quickly, people will have little choice but to be impacted by the war in various ways becoming refugees within their own country, the fighting in the countryside will consume many villages and homes, the bombings, they're fleeing from the encroaching Vietnamese armies, both communist and from the South Vietnamese, as well as the Khmer Rouge, who will soon be administering whole provinces of the country rather than just conducting their guerrilla struggle from the sidelines. Now, all of those coming misfortunes and I shouldn't skirt around it, let's say all of that coming destruction and mass death and suffering, that is still not an absolute certainty in the first few weeks of the Lon Nol regime. This all kind of comes down to those four miscalculations that Chandler thought of that we touched on before. So the first being that maybe Sihanouk would just accept not being the leader anymore and become a figurehead in the Cambodian government. Nope. He's launched a full-scale insurrection using Vietnamese training, troops, and Chinese aid. 
The second was that the communist Vietnamese forces would go back to Vietnam. Nope. In fact, now they will be actively fighting your weak army now that Sihanouk is no longer on your side and they still need to protect their forces in the country. The third was the possibility of staying neutral. This one is interesting because very, very early on, the new government in Phnom Penh attempts to keep up with this neutrality thing. They say they aren't this side or that, they just want the Vietnamese communists out, naturally. That all changes pretty quick once they are being swamped by Viet Cong armies and they will reach out to the United States for immediate military assistance and ask for as much as they can get. Now, this is a really big miscalculation as well, because as we discussed in the last episode, Nixon's whole presidential campaign was about getting out of Indochina. They're done. And we'll talk about this in a moment as it links to the discussion of CIA influence on the coup generally. But just to wrap up on that fourth miscalculation, being that the Khmer Rouge would be content to just not try and get power, no, this has backfired as well. They've been significantly boosted by Sihanouk's rally to their side. And there's kind of a fifth miscalculation as well, which I would add, which is that they didn't really take into account what kind of support they would get for their plans. So like, what, what, what support the Lon Nol regime thinks they're going to get under this vague umbrella of American aid, military and financial. But the definitive shape that that takes, I don't think it would be what they really expected, and I don't think it would be on the time scale they expected either. The big difference pre- and post-coup is really just how officially Cambodia will now be part of the Vietnam War. Like, it was already in it. It was just kept out of sight and mind, and it was being done on a smaller scale. But there was still bombing of Vietnamese troops, there was still engagement between US troops and South Vietnamese troops to attack Viet Cong troups across the border. There was a Khmer Rouge civil war going on. But all of these things, as we said at the start of the episode, they just get, you know, a ten times multiplier overnight once Sihanouk is deposed, and he makes that choice to form the Liberation Front. So naturally, with the coup being this very easily pointed to dividing line, it is a popular place for people interested to start blaming one side or another for what is going to occur under the Khmer Rouge in five years' time. And as is the case with much of the conflicts around the world during the Cold War, there are always suggestions of CIA interference as a means of securing American interests. Therefore, you will very commonly see online or in some books the sentence, it was a CIA-sponsored coup that removed Sihanouk from power. So how true is that? Well, across the eight or nine books I've used as sources for this episode, Osborne is probably the one that leans most toward there being evidence that the CIA were involved. So does Matthew Yeagle, who I spoke with last year on the show. He wrote a book about Son Yok Tan, and he includes some of the evidence in that book that he thinks is convincing. And the other two I have here that say there was CIA influence, one of them is Sihanouk's book titled My War with the CIA, so you can imagine what he says. And in the Shawcross book, he isn't conclusive either way, but does point to a few choice quotes from some CIA agents that allude to something. I think overall, these historians, aside from Sihanouk, who's absolutely certain, they would say that there was some knowledge of what was going on, but I'm not sure how much they would suggest that it was a really coordinated effort. And for instance, Short, Chandler, in the two books I'm using from him, and Steve Hedder, they all basically say the same thing. And I'll quote Hedder because he has perhaps the best version. Although some historians' accounts have credited parts of the allegation of CIA involvement, the evidence is not compelling. End quote. So what is the best evidence that people put forward? Well, Yeagle, for instance, he seems pretty sure. He says that a lot of the best evidence is coming from looking at a character in the story that's been there for a long time, Son Yok Tan. He still had his Khmer Sarai forces in South Vietnam, and was certainly this person that had been supported by American interests as they overlapped. Earlier in 1969, there had been a large defection of these Khmer Sarai to the Cambodian government. 
Sienor points to this in his book as well. The idea is that this defection of these troops was a ruse, and that they had been installed in Phnom Penh to be able to militarily support an action against Sienor, and that this had been facilitated by the CIA. Son Yok Tan himself also said, years later, oh yes, the CIA helped us out. But most people don't believe him on this. Even Yeagle doesn't take him at face value there. Uh, Milton Osborne, he uses some interviews that he and another journalist did that reference what Son Yok Tan's brother said, that he had been consulted by Lon Nol in September 1969, and that a coup had been planned from then. Whereas Chandler actually points to this as potentially Sihanouk being involved in that decision. Basically to, you know, get Lon Nol to go speak with Tan as a means of securing some of these Khmer Sarai troops to help militarily if there was a communist Vietnamese invasion and they needed this support. The CIA agent that Shawcross mentions, Frank Snap, he says that from operations in South Vietnam, they were expectant that if there was a Lon Nol government, that he would have welcomed US support. So they were therefore supportive of him, and he also says that by this stage they were still encouraging Son Yok Tan in a similar way. And that is kind of it in terms of evidence for the CIA did it. What people counter a lot of that is with, well, the Americans at this time, generally, they're quite pleased with how Sihanouk had been going. He had allowed the bombing, he had become more vocally anti-Vietnamese, and he had re-established diplomatic ties. So why would they have risked upsetting the apple cart if he was basically doing what they wanted? I found a declassified report from the CIA about the coup, basically just after it occurred. And it's, well, it's a report, it's an assessment of the situation. These declassified documents rarely, however much you want them to, start with something like, Agent Gary here. So after we assassinated JFK, we went on to Cuba and... Yeah, it's, it's rarely that. And I know what you're thinking, Lachlan. Don't be stupid. The CIA didn't assassinate Kennedy. That was the FBI. <laughs> Pulled the old switcheroo on you there, but all joking aside, those hoping to find proof of the CIA being behind the CNO coup, you know, I'm not going to find it in these unclassified documents, and it's definitely not going to just say, yep, we did it. However, reading this, you know, assessment of the situation, and it wouldn't have been done for nothing, it does very much read with a sense of, we don't quite know what's going to happen next. And this bit really testifies to that. Quote, The move against Sihanouk has opened a Pandora's box. No one on the Cambodian scene at present can command the authority or legitimacy that Sihanouk enjoyed. By the force of his personality and wits, Sihanouk managed to keep the contending royal and personal factions in line. These same groups are now united in their opposition to Sihanouk and their desire to do something about the Vietnamese communist threat, but how long they will stay together if things begin to get rough is another matter. The charges of corruption that they have levelled against Sihanouk's entourage are also, to varying degrees, applicable to many of them. They have no magic formula for meeting Cambodia's problems, nor do they have great experience in running the country. End quote. So that is a little less than convincing if the idea was that the CIA had coordinated this coup against Sihanouk with Lon Nol and Sirik Matak and the Khmer Sarai and Son Yok Tan, and then when it happens, they just sort of sit back and say, yeah, who knows where, the, where this is going to go? Um, I don't know. What I'm inclined to think, unless more evidence becomes available, is more or less somewhere in the middle. I think the CIA was run much less as a central agency, if you pardon the phrase, and I think there would have always been some agents in contact with all kinds of people, given their own space to do their own things, given some guidelines, maybe some general objectives, rather than necessarily you know, everything being decided by some managing director. If something came up in conversation with one agent and one contact and they said, oh, you want to go against Sihanouk? Yeah, sure, you should. It's fine with us. And I think that was basically the extent of it, that the preferences of the CAA were known to the people that planned the coup. But that's not the same as saying that the CIA came to them and said, let's do a coup. 
so yeah, in terms of direct responsibility and planning, I agree with Hedda. I don't think the evidence is compelling enough to say it was a CIA coup. What is far more factual to say is that the agency had become aware of the plotters' plans. And when it happened, well, it happened, and they dealt with what they were dealt. And now they potentially had a leadership that would be even more open to direct confrontation with the communists in Cambodia. More so than just secret bombings and occasional border incursions. As that declassified document says, quote, There is considerable pressure in the army for more forceful measures against the communists probably even if that would involve direct cooperation with the US and South Vietnamese forces. Neither Sirik Matak nor Lon Nol is ideologically committed to neutrality, and both men are capable of calling on the US for assistance if they deem it necessary to protect Cambodia or their own positions. How far they are willing to push the communists depends on a number of factors neither they nor we can predict. End quote. So I think that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Now, what I think a really interesting point that this anonymous CIA agent writing this makes, this really great point, and I'm not sure if I've really seen it elsewhere, and I think it's quite compelling, it's this, quote, having ousted Sihanouk on this issue, he means the Vietnamese problem, having ousted Sihanouk on this issue, the new leaders have created a major domestic issue. Now, they are in the uncomfortable position of having to demonstrate some progress in meeting it. Lon Nol and Sirik Matak now have to prove that they can do better. End quote. So the reason I find that very interesting is that A, I haven't really seen that take on this before, and B, the results of this are immediately apparent. Think about it. You've just removed the most popular leader in modern Cambodian history. All that talk of Island of Peace and Malord Papa and all of that. You've removed him amongst these riots you've stirred up around this problem of the Vietnamese communists on the land and saying it was all his fault that they were there. Now, you have some pretty big shoes to fill. And if you've... I mean, if this was an election, you've ran on this campaign promise to fix that issue more than anything else. So what happens? Well, Lon Nol's ultimatum for the Vietnamese troops to leave has already failed before they even staged the coup. So what do you do next? Well, that is where this story becomes extremely grim. When we see what this new government will resort to. Something gets unleashed. This will create an atmosphere where old ethnic hatreds will emerge unchecked. And the idea of the urgency of fixing this Vietnam problem that had spread through the upper echelons of power, well, it's going to spread through all of the society. Eight weeks after the coup, Lon Nom will make a declaration that all Vietnamese, communist or not, must leave the country and return to Vietnam. That's more than a quarter of a million people. It will take on a quasi-religious as well as racial dimension. When Lon Nol begins referring to the communists as Tamil, a Buddhist term drawn from Sri Lanka that meant Tamil, or non-believers. The lines will be blurred between the Vietnamese communists, or just Vietnamese generally, as the old hereditary enemies, a staple of Cambodian nationalism since the beginning of the 20th century. There will be pogroms, there will be government-sanctioned killings of Vietnamese civilians, massacres will occur, and Nixon will launch an invasion of Cambodia that will push things even closer to the brink of disaster. And we will fully explore these circumstances in the next episode, in the next season of the show. Season 1, we looked at everything up to Cambodian independence. Season 2, we have covered Sihanouk's Cambodia and the rise of the Khmer Rouge. Season 3, this is it. We will cover the Civil War, Pol Pot beginning his revolution in parts of the country as early as 1972. The bombing, the end of the bombing, the siege of Phnom Penh, April 17th, Everything that occurs in the nightmare of democratic Kampuchea. If you've been with me, with this podcast from the start, back in 2018, or any time after that, thank you so much for being on this journey. If you've just started listening, well, that's good for you because it means you didn't have to wait six years to get to where we are now. Thank you so much for listening. Please check out the Patreon to support the show. The link is in the description. 
Look out for a season two recap quite soon, and then it is on to the darkest parts of this story, as I hope to explain how things go so terribly wrong. Until next time, this is Lachlan Peters. This is In the Shadows of Utopia. Goodbye. Goodbye.